Hemingway of the cinema. It's a satire of Hollywood that focuses on the last days of a legendary film director who's trying to make a comeback with what he thinks is an innovative project. What's that about the movie? The Other Side of the Wind is Orson Welles' most personal work, as it's naturally based on elements of his own life. Well, we don't actually know. The film, which had to wait nearly 50 years to be completed and released, is now available on Netflix, along with a bonus documentary that captures the behind-the-scenes drama surrounding how it was made. It's a little of everything. It's kind of a departure in movie making. The other side of the wind, what is... In their Love Me When I'm Dead, we get to see Wells at work and how he's struggling to make a comeback just like the protagonist who stars in his The Other Side of the Wind. Because it was self-financed, Wells could only film the movie whenever he made enough money from acting gigs or appearances in television commercials. Everybody will think it's autobiographical, but it's not. Before Wells kicked off his filmmaking career at the age of 26, he was already well known through his theatre work and voice acting. But it was thanks to his feature film, Citizen Kane, that he secured his place in cinematic history. He co-wrote, produced, directed and starred in the mystery drama that many critics and fans consider the greatest movie of all time. Do you agree? No, certainly not. That's My next take. one is, though. Could you give us the title of that? I haven't decided what it is yet. Oh. <laughs> With its radically innovated uses of cinematography, varying narrative structures and music, it was nothing like anyone had ever seen before. From his 1958 film, Touch of Evil, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to strap you in the electric chair, boy. To the much acclaimed person. The Trial. Who accuses me? Wells went on to push the boundaries of filmmaking with his pioneering techniques. One example, for the battle scenes in Chimes at Midnight, the director invented editing methods to give the appearance of watching armies of thousands, when only around 200 extras were available. Throughout his career, Wells experienced ups and downs, with many of his films receiving less than a warm reception, but that eventually changed over time. Today, he's remembered as the man who transformed modern cinema. And with the release of The Other Side of the Wind, which spent years deteriorating in a Paris vault, one wonders if there are any other unfinished Wells projects that could see the light of day. Orson said, they'll love me when I'm dead. Let's find out more about how Orson Welles reshaped modern cinema by speaking to Josh Karp. He's the author of a book titled Orson Welles' Last Movie. Thank you so much for being with us today, Josh. Now, tell me why it took Orson Welles so long to create this movie and the various different obstacles that he faced doing it. Sure. Um, so uh, the movie is called The Other Side of the Wind, and Welles made it between 1970 and 76, but never finished it while he was still alive. And um, he, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine today that somebody like Orson Welles would have trouble raising money to make a movie. But in fact, he had an enormous amount of trouble getting money because his movies had never really made a lot of money. So he had um, come back to the United States in 1970 looking to get funding to make this movie and um, really couldn't find money. So he started making the movie with his own money and then ran into all kinds of production problems. So he would um, make the movie for six months then go shoot a commercial or a TV show or a movie for six months and then come back and make the movie for another six months. So he kind of, for a long time, funded the film with his own money. So that was one of the major problems. Mm -hmm. um, he ultimately mm -hmm. wound up uh, having the film funded by the Chavarron's brother-in-law, which in the 70s was not a great time to be getting funded by, you know, um, a member of the Saudi royal family. So any complication that could have arisen, he, he ran into it. He faced, unfortunately. Now, the idea of The Other Side of the Wind actually came, uh, if I'm not mistaken, after a fist fight that he had with Ernest Hemingway. Tell me a bit about the story behind this movie. Sure. When, when Orson Welles was very young, I think he was probably 22 years old, he was a huge um, director and star on Broadway. And uh, he um, was asked to narrate a Spanish Civil War documentary called the, I think, The Spanish Earth. And it was written by Hemingway. And Wells uh, went in to uh, narrate, the, um, narrate the documentary, and Hemingway was there the day he was doing it. 
And Wells was just a compulsively creative person, and he always loved to change things at the last minute. So he started changing the script. And at this time, Hemingway was probably almost 40 or 35, and he was very famous. And uh, he took offense as Wells was changing the script and telling him all the ways he could improve it. And they wound up literally having a fight in front of a movie screen that was showing a war. Um, and the two of them you know, beat each other up and then suddenly looked at each other and started to laugh and, uh, and became, at least somewhat for a while, um, fairly good friends. But Wells kind of remembered that inspiration when he was coming up with the character um, of Jake Hannaford, who's the main character on the other side of the wind, who's mm -hmm. this very masculine um, film director. Um, now, Josh, tell me a bit about why uh, Orson Welles eventually exiled himself into Europe. Sure. Um, and, and as, in 1958, Welles made a movie called Touch of Evil, which is now considered to be, you know, one of the great films. Um, at the time, he had finished his version of the film and given it to the studio, and they made all kinds of changes to it. And they didn't like this, and they didn't like that. And Welles was so upset because all that ever really mattered to him was he never really cared about money or things like that. He cared about his creative product. And he... Um, he wrote them a 58-page memo telling them all the ways they could change things. And when they did not respond, Wells just left and kind of gave up on Hollywood and said, OK, I'll go make movies in Europe and do it on my own. His own form of boy boycotting Hollywood, let's say. Uh, what did he think yes. about Hollywood when he went back then? Well, you know, in 1970, everything had changed. Um, there was this phenomenon called New Hollywood, where young directors, uh, particularly Dennis Hopper, who uh, had made Easy Rider, were all of a sudden kind of in charge, and the studios no longer had uh, control. They, they realized that they didn't know what people wanted to watch. So Wells thought, OK, they're giving all these young, kind of artistic people control of the town. He thought, OK, this is a great time for me to come back and, uh, and, and get money to make a film. But he was just incapable of, of, of I think, working with studios and, and people agreeing, agreeing with you know, executives um, on projects. So he wound up having to start funding it on his own. He was an absolutely creative mind. Uh, Josh Karp, thank you so much for joining us today on Showcase to speak about Orson Welles. Oh, thank you for having me.